Welcome to this week's edition of SKNIS Week in Review. I am your host, Kimberly Grant. This is a weekly program that highlights some of the top stories of the work of the government of St. Kitts and Nevis. Here are the top stories for February 22nd to 28th. CARICOM heads to have robust discussion on advancing CSME. Chairperson of CARICOM, PM Harris, lauded by CARICOM Secretary General for leadership in promoting peaceful dialogue on Venezuelan crisis. And CAFA and NUI signed Memorandum of Understanding to collaborate on health and education initiatives. Efforts to strengthen the advancement of the CARICOM single market and economy will continue following recent developments that promote free movement of people, goods, services, and capital and robust discussions slated for the 30th intersessional meeting of the Conference of Heads of Government of CARICOM. The CSME is designed to deepen economic integration among member states of the Caribbean community by creating single market economic space for the production of competitive goods and services among participating members. In December last year, heads of government of the Caribbean community expanded on the category of skilled workers who can move freely, including agricultural workers, security guards, beauticians, and barbers. The opening ceremony for the two-day intercessional meeting held at the St. Kitts Marriott, outgoing CARICOM chair and Prime Minister of Jamaica, the Most Honorable Andrew Holness, said these are significant elements that will help to debunk the myth that free movement of skilled personnel caters to only a few. The development was one of the several outcomes of the 18th special meeting of heads held in Trinidad on December 3rd and 4th of 2018. The focus was on CSME and resulted in the St. Anne Declaration on CSME. Other outcomes included allowing a greater voice for private sector and labor, greater collaboration between CARICOM and the organization of the Eastern Caribbean states, public procurement and mutual recognition of member states incorporated companies, and commitment to national action to further CSME impl implementation. Also in 2018, the establishment of the protocol on contingent rights was finalized to allow dependents of persons with approved skill certification to move freely with their loved ones and access basic social services. Ambassador Irvin Lowak, Secretary General of the Caribbean Community, lauded Prime Minister Dr. The Honorable Timothy Harris, Chairman of CARICOM, for his leadership in promoting peaceful dialogue on the current political impasse in Venezuela. Secretary General Lawak made the announcement at the opening ceremony of the 30th Intersessional Meeting of Conference Heads of Government of CARICOM on Tuesday, February 26. That leadership role has been passed seamlessly to the Prime Minister of St. Kitts and Nevis, Dr. Harris, Prime Minister Harris, who has taken in stride a hectic and challenging schedule that has been thrust upon him due primarily to events in our wider region over the past two months. Principal among those has been the efforts to secure a peaceful resolution of the crisis that has engulfed our neighboring country, Venezuela. Ambassador Lawak said that the heads of government have engaged in two emergency meetings in 2019 to find a way forward to bring about a resolution. We are acutely aware of the consequences of any alternative solution and with our like-minded partners have stressed the need for an internal and meaningful dialogue without which the situation could become disastrous. The community maintains that the solution must come from among the Venezuelan people and abides by the internationally recognized and accepted principles of non-interference, non-intervention in the affairs of states, respect for sovereignty, adherence to the rule of law, and respect for human rights and democracy. His Excellency Lawak noted that the principle of non-interference also applies as CARICOM countries confront a persistent threat to our efforts at development in the region. The conference ended on Wednesday, February 26. An important aspect of the 30th Intersessional Meeting of Conference Heads of CARICOM was the signing of the Memorandum of Understanding between the Caribbean Public Health Agency and the University of the West Indies on Tuesday, February 26th. 
Taffer's Executive Director, Dr. James Hospitalis, and Sir Hilary Beckles, Vice Chancellor of UWE, signed the agreement. So you're bringing together the two organizations responsible for edu higher education and for public health uh, to join forces to strengthen training and research to address the health priorities of our region from chronic diseases, climate and health, violence and injuries, the environment we live in. The executive director said that the written agreement is for five years and it packages a lot of what we already do in the region, such as economics in St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago, chronic disease at Cave Hill campus in Barbados, and climate and health at Mona campus in Jamaica. I hope we'll be able to leverage it to mobilize more resources for the noble purpose that we both have. So Hillary said that the signing is significant as it points primarily to putting our house in order. He said that one of the biggest problems in the regions faced is the spread of viruses, noting that the cooperation with CAFA will help to address such. Four primary schools in St. Kitts went head to head to compete in this year's History and Heritage Primary School quiz finals at the Anglican Church Hall on February 26. The competition showed off just how knowledgeable the youngsters were in the history, geography and culture of St. Kitts and Nevis. Participating schools were the Tyrrell Williams, Joshua Obadiah, Sadler's Primary School and the George Moody Stewart School. All schools performed well, but it was Sadler's Primary School that took home the grand prize, the Sir Corbin Innes Trophy. Percival Hanley, Chairman of the History and Heritage Committee and General Manager of the Brimstone Hill Fortress National Park Society, said that the teachers did an excellent job in preparing the children. He also encouraged the students to continue learning. Don't just stick to the textbooks that you have in school, learn about everything around you. And you see how useful it can become when you are doing a quiz like this. So please make sure you open your minds to everything, take note of everything around you and learn them. The official opening of History and Heritage Month, which is celebrated annually in the month of February, took place on January 31st at Matherton House at Taylor's Range. The month-long calendar of activities, which was started by the late Sir Perban Innes, is being celebrated under the theme African Survivals in St. Kitts and Nevis. The Department of Environment launched the Global Environment Facility funded Integrating Water Land Ecosystem Management in the Caribbean Small Island Developing States Demonstration Project on February 26 at the Ocean Terrace Inn with the goal of reducing and reversing land degradation in the Federation of St. Kitts and Nevis. The project entitled Addressing Impacts of Acute Land Degradation in College Street Gut in St. Kitts and Quarries and Sand Mining Hotspots in Nevis will aid to strengthen the institutional capacity, improve the policy framework and facilitate pilot projects within the College Street Gut watershed in St. Kitts and key quarry sites nearby wetlands and quarries in Nevis that are earmarked for rehabilitation. Land degradation issues have traditionally taken somewhat of a back seat to the other urgent environmental issues. We are ever cognizant though of the dangers of constantly pushing aside the important to deal with the urgent. Head of the Department of Environment and Senior Environment Officer June Hughes said that the department is pleased to have the GEF funding this very important initiative in the Federation and heartened to the fact that the GEF has chosen to prioritize land degradation by funding this critical project. Degraded ecosystems result in the loss of biodiversity which is so critical to our ultimate existence. The failure to implement early intervention measures to mitigate against this particular threat, especially within the context of a small island state, can ultimately lead to economic failure. She explained that land degradation has many root causes, some human-induced and others natural, which can negatively affect the ability of the land to effectively function within the ecosystem. She said that this can also threaten food security as well as land stability. We therefore welcome with open arms this opportunity to work on some of our land management issues. 
This project will afford us a chance to learn new techniques and methodologies to solve some of our degradation problems. I would implore us to replicate whatever, wherever possible, the outputs from each of the components on both of the islands. The five-year multifocal regional project has a total of 10 participating countries and is headed by the UN environment. When completed, the second cruise pier at Port Zante will accommodate three Oasis-class vessels simultaneously. This, by no means, is a small feat says Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable Ian Patches Lightburn, during the sitting of National Assembly on February 20th, adding that local contractors have benefited greatly from the project. Minister Lightburn said that one of the mandate from the cabinet for the project is to, as much as possible, source material and labor locally. He reported that one of the local contractors, Kelly Construction, is making all the precast slabs and beams. To date, they have already procured 2,000 cubic yards of concrete, which is being supplied by TDC Group of Companies. 1,000 tons of steel will be used in the project, reported the minister. 1,000 tons of steel will be used in the project, reported the minister. Over 90% of the steel is already at the site. TDC has supplied 55%. Steel, concrete, and don't lose sight of the fact, Mr. Speaker, that all the material is being quarried locally, be mined. At Oro Bay, there will be need for either 20 or 30, 20 ton Armour rocks that will come from the, 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 the public works quarry. Approximately 100 persons have been employed for the construction of the second cruise pier at Port Zante, said Minister Leibard, highlighting that all welders at the site are local welders procured by the main contractor American Bridge. All timber, fuel, and other consumables are sourced locally, he said. The timber has been supplied by TDC and the fuel from Seoul. The pier lighting will be procured and installed locally by Kelly Construction. Approximately 400 to 500,000 are being spent monthly on procurement of supplies locally. Hundreds of local construction workers in St. Kitts and Nevis are set to benefit from the commencement of the second phase of the Island Mainwood Rehabilitation Project which is expected to begin by end of March. Phase 2 covers the areas between Kayon and Challengers traveling eastward. Minister of Public Infrastructure, the Honorable Ian Patches Lybert, said that the mobilization process has already begun. This includes inviting tenders from qualified local contractors to bid on various works, such as constructing drains and sidewalks in their respective communities. George Gilbert, engineer at the Public Works Department, said that this will allow the economic benefits of the project to spread to different communities. The competitive bidding stage will result in the awarding of nine contracts in this stance. The contracts will be signed at a public ceremony designed to generate public awareness to the scope and time frame of the work as well as to promote transparency. Construction activity will initially begin in Cabbage Street and Wash Street Gut in Kayon, Otley's, Borea, Molyneux, Christchurch, Sadler, Mansion, and Bellevue. The additional tenders will be issued at a later date. In total, 56 tenders are expected to be issued to local companies. Five local contractors employing more than 100 workers completed the work on the phase one, which covered the areas between camps and challenges, as well as Connery to Keys. 27 heavy truckers also shared in the economic activity generated from phase one. Wednesday's February 27th edition of Working For You provided the public with a vast knowledge of several opportunities offered by the government of the Republic of China, Taiwan, which nationals are encouraged to capitalize on. 
resident ambassador of the Republic of China, Taiwan, to St. Kitts and Nevis, His Excellency Tom Lee, and permanent secretary in the Ministry of Education, William Hodge, appeared on the program to engage the public on Taiwan's cooperation within the Federation in Education through its scholarship programs. Presently, Taiwan offers two types of scholarships to nationals of St. Kitts and Nevis the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Scholarship and the International Cooperation and Development Fund Scholarship. There is also a postgraduate four-year course in medicine at the ISO University in Taiwan. Applicants should possess a bachelor's degree in the field to apply. The programs cover a variety of fields such as business, management, agriculture, Mandarin, Chinese, engineering, technology, and nursing. The programs cover a variety of fields such as business, management, agriculture, Mandarin Chinese, engineering, technology, and nursing from a variety of universities. Applications for the Taiwanese scholarship for ICDF and MOFO opened in January. The deadline for the ICDF is March 15th, while the MOFO is March 31st. Late applicants will not be accepted. Thank you for joining us on this week's episode. See you next time.